In this video, we'll learn the network science of epidemics and infodemics. The topic of epidemics is a combination of biological issues and social issues. Infodemic refers to an overabundance of information, some accurate and some not, rendering it difficult to find trustworthy sources of information and reliable guidance. What's in common between epidemics and infodemics? It is the infrastructure that allows the spread of diseases and information. And this infrastructure is the network we've been studying this semester. Let's start with epidemics. When we talk about an infectious disease, the first thing come to our mind might be the properties of bacteria and virus. Take coronavirus as an example. We are interested in how contagious the virus is. We now know that a person with coronavirus may be contagious 48 to 72 hours before starting to experience symptoms. In fact, people without symptoms may be more likely to spread the illness because they are unlikely to be isolating and may not adopt behaviors designed to prevent the spread. We are also interested in how long the incubation period is. The incubation period is the number of days between when you are infected with something and when you might see symptoms. For coronavirus, the incubation period is five days on average. If you are infected, your symptoms begin to show up five days after exposure. Most people with the symptoms had them by day 12. We are also interested in how severe coronavirus is. This depends on the strain of the virus and the patient's immune system. Overall, the death rate of COVID-19 patients was about 18.5%. This number will change as the coronavirus continues to mutate and we develop immunity through vaccines. All of the issues we just mentioned are biological issues. Here comes the question. It was the same coronavirus why did some countries control the virus spread better than others? This is because how the coronavirus spreads is not just determined by the biological factors of the virus. It is also determined by social networks. The social networks within a population, such as the size and the structure of the networks, play an important role in how an infectious disease is likely to spread from one person to another. More specifically, a contact network gives a disease opportunities to spread. In the contact network, nodes represent people. The ties represent two people come into contact with each other in a way that a virus is transmitted from one individual to another. If you want to predict an outbreak of an infectious disease, you need to consider the social networks that enable the virus to spread among humans. To study an epidemic, a traditional way is to calculate R0. You probably heard it before because news media actually talk about R0 last year. R0 indicates how contagious a disease is. It is the expected number of new infectors directly generated by an infected individual for a given time period. If R0 is greater than 1, it means one infector can infect more than one susceptible individual. So an outbreak is self-sustaining unless effective control measures are implemented. The R0 for seasonal flu is 1.3. For COVID-19, it's 2 to 2.5. For measles, it's 12 to 18. Even though measles is super contagious, but MMR vaccine can prevent us from getting it. 
CDC recommends children get two doses of MMR vaccine, starting with the first dose at 12 through 16 months of age, and the second dose at 4 through 6 years of age. Some people may think there is not much difference in R not between flu and COVID-19. Coronavirus just infects one more person. This claim is problematic. First, we have flu vaccine. That's why doctors urge people to get a flu shot every year. Second, R not is just for one round of infection. Coronavirus does not stop infecting people after one round. Let's look at the network impact of COVID-19. In the first round of spread, the virus infected two people. In the second round of spread, two people infect four people. In the third round, four people infect eight people. Do you see a problem with this model? It assumes that human interactions are random. It does not consider one infector can encounter a hundred susceptible individuals. It does not consider the hubs in social networks. Those hubs are the super spreaders. They don't just infect two susceptible individuals. One super spreader or super spreading event can infect. Hundreds of thousands of people. Researchers investigated the superspreading events of coronavirus in Boston area from March to May 2020. Their findings suggest that there were more than 120 introductions of coronavirus into the Boston area, but not every introduction of coronavirus had the same impact. We've known from the previous videos on small world networks and scale-free networks, the hubs in networks have much larger impact on the networks. This applies to the case of the spread of coronavirus in the Boston area. Only a few of the introductions of coronavirus were responsible for most local transmission. Twenty-nine percent of the introductions accounted for. 85% of the cases. Researchers used genomic data of the virus and identified at least two superspreading events that amplified the spread. One superspreading event was in a nursing facility where multiple introductions of coronavirus were detected in a short time period. Only one of those introductions led to rapid and extensive spread within the facility. The spread led to a significant mortality in the vulnerable population in the nursing facility. So even in a superspreading event, not everyone in the event had the same impact. In this particular superspreading event, we had one superspreader. A second superspreading event was an international conference held at a Boston hotel in February. Ironically, the conference was about biotechnology. This two-day conference led to sustained community transmission, including outbreaks in homeless and other higher-risk communities, and the transmission went beyond the Boston area. The virus was transmitted domestically and internationally, ultimately resulting in as many as 330,000 cases. The dense social contact networks in urban areas provides a perfect environment for fast spread of infectious diseases. By 2030, it is estimated that more than 60 percent of the world's population will live in urban areas. How to contain an outbreak before it becomes an epidemic? You can use network science to tackle this problem. One way is to simulate people's contact networks. You can consider the contact networks as two-mode networks. What are the two-mode networks? They include two types of nodes. To construct the contact networks, 
You can use one type of nose to represent people, and use another type of nose to represent specific locations. You then use ties to indicate people's movements from one location to another, like what you see on the screen. What are the properties of this two-mode network? Do you still remember small world networks? In the previous video, we mentioned that many social networks are actually small world networks. What are the properties of small world networks? They have high clustering coefficient and low average path length. The high clustering coefficient means the disease transmission is highly clustered. The low average path length means it takes only a few steps for the diseases to travel from one person to anyone else in the contact networks. If you convert this two-mode network to a one-mode network that only includes locations, you will find the location network is a scale-free network. What are the properties of scale-free networks? The degree distribution of nodes follow a power law distribution. That means only a few locations are highly efficient in transmitting diseases. Those locations are like the one percent of super rich in our society. Those locations are considered as the super spreader locations. The network properties of small world networks and scale-free networks ensure the efficiency of collective network behavior. This is why many biological networks have similar network properties. In this case, pathogens like bacteria and virus are transmitted efficiently in the networks. Imagine that you have this network analysis findings. Your job is to provide recommendations for policymakers to control a fast-moving disease as soon as possible. What are your recommendations? Do you recommend mass vaccination that offers vaccination to everyone in the population? Or do you recommend targeted vaccination that offers vaccination to a few? If you recommend targeted vaccination, how do you identify those who need to be vaccinated? Do you set up testing sites everywhere, or do you set up testing sites selectively? If you recommend selective testing sites, how do you identify locations of testing sites? You can answer. All of the above questions by using your knowledge of small world networks and scale-free networks. One more thing: the contact networks for different diseases can have very different network structures. Why? This is because different diseases have different modes of transmission. Coronavirus can be transmitted through coughs and sneezes, so the contact networks have a lot of ties that connect two people who end up in the same location. But HIV, that is human immunodeficiency virus, the virus causes AIDS, does not travel through the air. Even though HIV is highly lethal, it does not travel easily from person to person. In the contact networks of AIDS, you don't need to have ties that connect two people who work in the same office if they don't have the exchange of bodily fluids, and not all bodily fluids transmit HIV. So the AIDS contact networks are much sparser than the COVID-19 contact networks. We are now in the middle of a global pandemic of COVID-19. Obviously, this is not the end of human history of epidemics or pandemics. We humans have intruded a lot of natural places where many deadly viruses live. The convenience of international travel makes it easy for the spread of deadly viruses. It takes only one tie for an infectious disease to travel from a remote village to a densely populated city. 
The death rate of COVID-19 varies widely depending on age and how strong the patient's immune system is. When it comes to Ebola, it is more lethal than coronavirus. The fatality rate of the Ebola virus can be as high as 90%. It means if 10 people catch the Ebola virus, only one will survive. Ebola is a lethal virus named after the Ebola River in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Ebola is distantly related to measles, mumps, and rabies. It's also related to some pneumonia viruses, such as the parainfluenza virus, which causes colds in children, and the respiratory syncytial virus, which can cause fatal pneumonia in the person who has AIDS. The Ebola virus seems to have developed the worst elements of all of the above viruses. Like measles, it triggers a rash all over the body. Some of the effects resemble rabies, such as psychosis and madness. Ebola virus particle contains only seven different proteins. There are seven different types of large molecules. So the Ebola virus is a very simple virus, but it kills with high efficiency. Those proteins target your immune system. In this, they are like HIV, which also destroys the immune system. But unlike the silently creeping onset of HIV, the attack by the Ebola virus is explosive. As the Ebola virus multiply in your body, your immune system fails and you lose your ability to respond to the viral attack. Your body becomes a city under siege with its gates wide open and hostile armies pouring in, setting everything in your body on fire. From the moment the Ebola virus enters your blood spring, the war is almost lost. You are 90% doomed. The first known Ebola outbreak was in 1976 when the Ebola virus erupted simultaneously in 55 villages near the headwaters of the Ebola River. Like HIV, the Ebola virus was thought to have jumped from monkeys to humans. The Ebola virus is generally thought to reach new hosts through a break in their skin or through a permeable membrane like those in the nose and eyes. Some scholars say the Ebola virus could be transmitted through air, but we don't know how infectious air transmission is. Regardless, once the Ebola virus takes hold of a human body, it damages all internal organs and causes a hemorrhage. The blood comes out of all openings from Ebola patient's body, and the patients bleed to death. The Ebola virus in the patient's blood then attempts to find a new host. A droplet of the Ebola patient's blood can contain 100 million individual virus particles. If you want to know more about the origins of the Ebola virus, I highly recommend that you read a book titled The Hot Zone, The Terrifying True Story of the Origins of the Ebola Virus by Richard Preston. There is also a TV series on National Geographic based on the Preston's book. Now that you are studying network science, how would you use network science to help humans fight against the Ebola virus? A side note here, the emergence of Ebola and many other viruses from rainforests can be considered as the nature's immune system against the human's ruin of tropical rainforests. The tropical rainforests are a rich reservoir of life on the planet, including plants, animals, and viruses. When we destroy an ecosystem of a virus, they need to find a new host, and our humans become their targets. As human activities destroy the nature without reverence, the nature has activated its immune system against the human activities. One part of the nation's immune system 
is to spread lethal virus through human population. The second topic of this video is infodemics. There are clear connections between epidemic diseases and the diffusion of information through social networks. Both diseases and information can spread from person to person across similar kinds of networks that connect people. And in this aspect, they exhibit very similar structural mechanisms. In the 2013 report, the World Economic Forum named the viral spread of misinformation as one of the most dangerous global crises. The report called the massive digital misinformation as digital wildfires. The World Health Organization has called an infodemic as an overabundance of information, some accurate and some not, rendering it difficult to find trustworthy sources of information and reliable guidance. There are two terms related to infodemics. They are misinformation and disinformation. Misinformation is a false or inaccurate information, regardless of an intention to deceive. Misinformation is wrong, but may not be deliberately misleading. Examples are false rumors and pranks you pull off on April Fool's Day. This information is a species of misinformation that is deliberately deceptive. They are malicious and part of propaganda. The history of misinformation, along with that of disinformation and propaganda, is part of the history of mass communication. In the era of information age, social media sites have become a powerful platform for the spread of misinformation. Epidemics are a combination of biological issues and social issues. Pathogens need a social system so that they can reach new hosts. Likewise, Infodemics are a combination of false information and social systems. The social networks online enable false information to travel from one user to another. Users' social networks, both online and offline, particularly the network structures, determine how vulnerable they are to false information and extreme views. We've already had some discussion as we reflect on diversity in our own ego networks. Misinformation spreads faster on social media than traditional media such as newspaper and cable news. One reason is the lack of regulation and examination required before posting false information on social media sites. Those sites provide users with the capability to spread information quickly to other users without requiring the permission of a gatekeeper, such as an editor who may require confirmation of its truth before its publication. Without social media, you may have someone in your neighborhood spreading false information, but the impact is limited. With social media, Everyone can post something. There is no filter that was once placed on the diffusion of information. What kind of information attracts people's attention? Information that is personal and signals threat. This is because our brains prioritize threatening signals to preserve our children and ourselves. If you are in a building and all of a sudden you hear multiple gunshots followed by people screaming, what's your response? Those threatening signals grab all of your attention. You drop whatever you are doing. Your sensory system are on high alert. There is nothing wrong with this response. Our ancestors had this default response so that they could survive. In the information age, human brain's default response to threatening signals is now being taken advantage of. The information that evokes anxiety and fear gets people's attention. Many conspiracy theories evoke anxiety, fear, and even anger. 
The underlying component of conspiracy theories is that there is always a secret plan that someone is deliberately withholding from the public. The more anxiety and fear the information arouses, the more attention the information gets online. The more views and shares on social media, the more user engagement, the better business for social media companies. Many social media companies are driven by user engagement, not by the accuracy of information on their platform. Humans don't handle uncertainty very well. This is because uncertainty evokes anxiety. Our brains process uncertainty as feelings. Our emotional system is activated faster than the cognitive system. Very often, the information is processed underneath the threshold of consciousness. At the beginning of the COVID pandemic, since it was a completely new virus, there were a lot of uncertainties, such as how the virus was transmitted and how fatal the virus was. The uncertainties aroused anxiety and fear, which were very unsettling. To ease the unsettling feelings of anxiety and fear, people attempted to find more information. Social media, without a filter, allowed those who had no expertise in the virus to share information. Amid the pandemic, misinformation and disinformation can cost people's lives. Such as promoting unproven treatments. Moreover, people not just share information on social media; they also connect with like-minded people, creating an echo chamber. This is a consequence of the homophily effect. Birds of a feather flock together. The homophily effect in humans' social networks is partly driven by humans' confirmation bias. It is people's tendency to search for and interpret information in a way that confirms a predetermined assumption or conclusion. We tend to twist information to validate our existing beliefs and assumptions. We see what we want to see. This tendency is called confirmation bias. We selectively place trust in the information that is consistent with our preferences and beliefs, and selectively dismiss the information that is misaligned with our assumptions. Confirmation bias plays an important role in the spread of misinformation and disinformation. The human's tendency to selectively interact with like-minded people creates an echo chamber. In the echo chamber, everyone reinforces each other's views. What are the consequences? If you are trapped in an echo chamber, your views become more and more extreme. What's worse, once you are inside an echo chamber because of your view on one issue, you tend to embrace the entire corpus on different issues in the echo chamber. For example, if you are attracted to an echo chamber because of your view on the connection between vaccines and autism, you are likely to embrace the conspiracy theory. That Bill Gates planned to use a coronavirus vaccine to monitor people through an injected microchip. People with stronger logical analytical skills are actually more susceptible to the confirmation bias. The greater our cognitive capability, the greater our ability to rationalize and interpret information. To support our existing beliefs, when information supports an opposing view, people with better logical and analytical skills are more likely to come up with a counterargument that further strengthens their original view. This is known as the boomerang effect. Contradictory information does not make someone open-minded, but rather causing people to double down on their original beliefs. Does presenting facts and debunking campaign work? 
In fact, debunking campaigns can backfire. It sometimes reinforces people's pre-existing views, making them more entrenched in their original views. Sometimes presenting counter evidence can start an argument that quickly descends into more disagreements and ends up with further polarization. In this article titled "Science Versus Conspiracy: Collective Narratives in the Age of Misinformation," researchers investigated 73 Facebook pages. 39 of those Facebook pages published a conspiracy, and 34 published science news between 2010 and 2014. One of the findings was that Facebook users rarely left their echo chambers. People who read science news rarely read conspiracy news, and vice versa. But the conspiracy pages attract three times more users, and the users who focused primarily on conspiracy news tended to share the content more widely. The researchers also constructed the social networks of two groups of readers: science news readers and conspiracy news readers. The finding was that. The more you were exposed to a certain type of narratives, the greater the probability that all your Facebook friends had the same news preferences. It seems social media has amplified the echo chamber effect. Socializing with like-minded people online makes people further exclude anything that doesn't fit with their preferences and views. In my Common Core study, I tracked the tweets discussing the policy Common Core Day standards for an entire year. I also evaluated the tweets' emotional content. There were much more negative tweets than positive tweets in all states. Here is the map of sentiment index on the Common Core by state. The states with a darker shade of color had more negative sentiment toward the Common Core. It was likely that there was an echo chamber dominated by negative sentiment. Moreover, 33 of 34 high centrality Twitter users expressed negative sentiment. Of course, the echo chamber effect is not unique to the Common Core discussion on Twitter. Social media users' opinion on a controversial topic is influenced by the user's exposure to the one-sided social media comments, regardless of their reported level of previous knowledge. The internet reinforces the echo chamber effect. The internet is more effective in preaching the converts and mobilizing supporters than persuading and changing people's beliefs. Attitudes and opinions. This is a COVID nineteen hashtag network I created by using the tweets on COVID nineteen posted on Twitter within ten minutes. The dots are hashtags and the ties are co-occurrences of hashtags. Obviously, they are not random networks. How do I know it? The clustering coefficient of the network is 0.73. It means the network is highly clustered. This finding is consistent with the degree distribution. What about other social media platforms? In this article titled "The COVID-19 Social Media Infodemic," researchers analyzed misinformation spreads on five social media platforms, including Twitter, Reddit, YouTube, Instagram, and a less regulated platform called Gab. Researchers use the epidemiological models to calculate R naught. At the beginning of this video, I introduced R naught. It indicates how contagious a pathogen is. It is the expected number of new infectors directly generated by an infected individual for a given time period. 
If R naught is greater than one, it means one infector can infect more than one susceptible individual. So an outbreak is self-sustaining unless effective control measures are implemented. Researchers use SIR model to calculate R naught for all five social media platforms. Each platform had its R naught that was greater than one, suggesting the possibility of an infodemic. Researchers also noticed that R naught may be too simplistic to explain information spread. If you look at R naught of Instagram, it was 130. There was a drastic increase in the number of new users. It cannot be explained with it. It cannot be explained with the standard epidemic models. A value of R naught at 130 was way beyond what has been observed in any real world epidemic. Maybe scale free networks can provide some explanations. Twitter recently announced a new tool called Birdwatch to fight against misinformation. Twitter users can write notes on tweets, flagging them as false or misleading. They can even add links to their sources of information. They also rate each other's notes, which is a key part of Birdwatch. Twitter uses those ratings to put the most helpful notes at the top of the list and to build a reputation profile for Birdwatch users. Right now, Birdwatch is still in its pilot phase with about a thousand participants. Eventually, the plan is to make Birdwatch part of Twitter's main platform. Recall what we've just discussed about the network systems that enable false information to find new hosts. We've also discussed how network structure makes social media users vulnerable to false information. And presenting evidence can sometimes backfire, creating the boomerang effect. Here is the question to you all. Do you think Birdwatch is an effective tool to fight against misinformation? What's your rationale? Another issue I encounter as I study social networks and information spread on social media is bot. Social media bots are social media accounts that are not operated by humans. Social media bots run on computerized algorithms. They automatically generate social media posts and they are growing more and more sophisticated. They become more complex and more difficult to detect. Some social media bots goal is to increase the number of followers, shares, and retweets on social media. Not all bots are malicious and spread misinformation or disinformation, but some bots purposely spread certain types of information. Social media bots can also meddle with research that uses social media data as data sources. For example, tweets generated by bots were twice as likely as human operated social media accounts to share the validating information suggesting that e-cigarettes help people quit smoking. In a study about tweets describing recent experiences with cannabis, social media bots were also more likely than non-bots to tout the unsubstantiated health benefits of cannabis. If you are interested in using social media data to study information flow, public opinion, and behavior, it is very important that you differentiate the data generated by humans from the data generated by algorithms. You may also want to look into what role the bots play. If you don't weed out bots and network ties generated by them, you may artificially give the bots a voice by treating them as if they are real human beings, when those bots are just amplifying some voices. 
A big challenge for social media researchers is how to detect a bot. In my early days of social media research, I used the number of tweets and the frequency of tweets a Twitter account generated each day. But this was an outdated tool to detect bots. Nowadays, bots are designed to mimic human behavior. They can post at random intervals. Some bot developers mix in human-generated content with automated content to evade detection. Once you find a good way to detect bots, then the bot developers begin to work on better ways to evade your detection. One way to take advantage of bots is to create your own bots to conduct experiments online. This is very similar to confederates in psychological experiments, like the actor in Stanley Milgram's obedience to authority experiment. The article you see on the screen is an example of using bots in research. The researchers built bots that rebuked Twitter users who used racist language. One set of bots had profile pictures of white men. The other set had profile pictures of black men. Did two sets of bots have the same effect? The answer is no. The bots with white male profile picture had a stronger effect on toning down Twitter users' racist rhetoric. Simply changing the Twitter profile picture can significantly reduce other Twitter users' racist slur. In this video, I introduced how network analysis has been applied to study epidemics and infodemics. To fight the battle against misinformation and disinformation, one way is to prevent people from becoming the host of false information and transmitting it. Another way is to dismantle the social networks that enable the false information to find new hosts. What are your recommendations to flatten the curve of infodemics so that false information cannot spread far and fast?